were two people that went to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And don't forget, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They went to him, why? To become Muslims. And they both, two people, convert on the same day. One of them used to work a little harder than the other for the sake of Allah in da'wah, in jihad, and so on, to an extent that that person died as a martyr. The other friend, he died one year later at regular death, perhaps on bed or at work or so on. Talha bin Ubaidillah, a very righteous companion, he had a dream. In that dream he saw himself, he says, I was in front of the gates of Jannah and I saw these two people that became Muslim. And then a, an angel came out of Jannah and admitted the one who died later into Jannah first. Then the angel came outside and admitted the one who was martyred in the dunya second. Then the angel came for the third and last time and told me, Talha, irja, you go back, your time has not come yet. Talha woke up and he was so shocked and he was so amazed. He started telling people about the dream which he had. He went to Rasulullah wasallam. Don't forget, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never stop. No matter how many times you hear his beautiful name, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet told them, Ya Talha, why are you amazed? He said, Ya Rasulullah, a shaheed, a martyr, such a high status and honor. He goes to Jannah after the regular man who died only one year later. Subhanallah, how is it possible, Ya Rasulullah? He's not complaining from Allah. He's just wondering, he wants to know what is it that he has done that made him go to Jannah first because he has high dreams and ambitions and hope. So he would for sure, inshaAllah, pursue whatever that man did so he can go to Jannah first. Now before I move on this hadith, just to have a bigger picture and feel what Talha is experiencing, what's the status of Shaheed? What is so special that Talha thought by default Shaheed should go first? Number two, Talha, why does it matter, radiallahu anhu of course, who goes to Jannah first if they eventually went to Jannah? Well, it matters a lot. Number one, status of a shaheed. I'll mention one hadith for you to understand a little bit of it. And may Allah grant us the reward of the shaheed. Say Ameen. Rasulullah said that Allah will bless the shaheed with six traits. Number one, that the first drop of blood that will be shed from their body, Allah will forgive all of their sins and they will be able to see their seat in Jannah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised them that they will not be punished in the grave, they will not be scared and fearful when the people are so scared and running around when? On Yawm Al-Qiyamah. They will be given a crown of honor and dignity, Al-Wiqar. A lot of jewels are attached to it, only one of them is more valuable than the whole earth and whatever it contains, Allahu Akbar. They will also be given amongst the most beautiful spouse ever created by Allah. And lastly, they will be able to intercede for 70 of their family members. What an honor, Allahu Akbar. You see now he is so shocked why the shahid went next, SubhanAllah. The other thing that we may ask, why does it matter who goes first? Wallahi, it matters a lot. We would kill one another, perhaps not us, but we saw on TV, people would rush, I want to get the latest iPhone, I don't want to be the second, I want to be the first one, take pictures, tweet it, and so on. And this is dunya stuff. People would camp outside the movie theater for the latest movie that comes out, subhanAllah. Aren't we more worthy to be excited, to be the first one to ever hug the Prophet, to be the first one to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, the first group that goes to Jannah first is not as beautiful as the one who goes second. Why? Those first batch of people, may Allah make me and you amongst them, say Ameen. They will have the beauty of the moon. The second batch will have the also gorgeous faces and bodies, but as beautiful as the brightest star. So even that matters. So let's be ambitious and see what is it that man did that made him reach that level. Now back to the main hadith. The Prophet said, Talha, you're amazed. He says, yes, and he explains why. The Prophet asked him a question. And look at the beautiful answer. He said, Ya Talha, didn't that man witness one more later beyond the man who does a martyr? He said, Bala. He said, didn't he witness the whole month of Ramadan and he prayed more? Bala ya Rasulullah. He said, Rasulullah said, due to the witnessing of Ramadan and the praying of more, the difference between him and the martyr is like the difference between the heavens and the earth. Subhanallah. You know how much hope this gives me when I was preparing this talk, and I hope it gives you as well, that one Ramadan can take you beyond the shaheed, can take you beyond the one who has the whole Quran memorized if you come to Allah with sincerity. كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون.
you're fasting, especially if you're fasting in, a, in an interesting hot place like Texas in the summer, right? Or in the Khalid somewhere, or in Pakistan, or wherever, South Africa. When you're fasting, you're going to feel thirst. And it doesn't matter if you're religious or not, or old or young. This, it doesn't discriminate. Thirst doesn't discriminate. Hunger doesn't discriminate. You're going to feel hunger. And that feeling inside of you is basically your body asking you to disobey Allah. Isn't it? I mean, every ounce of thirst, every second of thirst that you feel, your body is screaming, give me water. Your, your, your stomach is really almost coming up with a song on its own. You know, feed me. There's a war happening inside you. Your body is asking you to rebel against Allah. And there's something in your heart that tells your, your throat and your stomach to shut up. Not until Maghrib. Not until Maghrib. You're fighting yourself the entire day. Yourself the entire day. There's a newlywed couple. He's crazy about her. He just looks at her and he goes, what am I supposed to do? Not until Maghrib. I'm going to hold myself back because I'm fasting. There, there's the strongest of the urges, intimacy. And of course, the most basic of needs, hunger and thirst. Allah blocked them for the entirety of the day. And you and I, if we're observing our fast, we're literally we're crushing the needs and the strongest desires of our body for the entirety of a day only to make Allah happy. Only to make Allah happy. And you like, there's a kid who's like 12 years old or 10 years old, he's fasting for the first time and he's looking at this melted piece of chocolate and he's got like a little thing of it on his, and he's just looking at it like... And he puts it back. <laughs> Even he's got taqwa. And then you're gonna do this. You know, every time you do this, you're developing a consciousness of Allah. Why is that exercise important? If you can do that through the entirety of a day to block yourself and deny yourself the most fundamental of your needs and the strongest of your wants. If you can, if you're capable of doing that, then you're, Allah is asking you for a lot less outside of the fast. He's asking you to actually يُحَرِّمُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْخَبَائِثِ The only thing He wants to prevent from you are filthy things. You're going to have a much easier time dealing with other acts of obedience of Allah. It's trained you. It's beautiful. You know, I, I put it this way. When, you know, for any tough job, like a rigorous training, like a military training, or police academy training, these kinds of trainings, there's a lot of tough exercise, yeah? And they go through hours and hours of regiments and trainings. And then that same guy decides to join some kind of light gym. And they have a workout routine. And he says, this is a joke. We used to do 10 times as much, yeah? So when he's come through a much tougher training, anything less is piece of cake, effortless. That's the idea of fasting. It's so tough. So when you're done with this, what Allah is going to ask you after that is piece of cake. You're ready for it. You'll develop the consciousness of, consciousness of Allah and you'll be much better able to protect yourself from disobeying Allah. When you're all alone, that's when you know whether you have taqwa or not. That's the reason it's the secret between you and Allah. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that all the acts of the children of Adam and the deeds is for them. Except fasting is for I, it's for me. And I will reward him for it. Because it's a secret between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fi ula. So since he closed all the gates, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open one gate for you. On Judgment Day, the gate of Rayyan. Nobody else will be able to go through this gate except those who fast for the sake of Allah. So you left your food for the sake of Allah. Allah will feed you from the food of heaven, inshallah. You left your drink for the sake of Allah. So Allah will quench your thirst from Hawd al Kawthar, inshallah. You left your whims and desires. For the sake of Allah, Allah will reward you abundance of eternal life and bless in Jannah. Ameen. The Prophet said, according to Abu Hurairah, when Ramadan comes, the gates of the hellfire close and the gates of paradise open up 
the gates of the hellfire close and the gates of the paradise open up so this means it's a chance the gates of paradise are open up for you it's a chance for you to enter paradise for eternity where you will not suffer any pains where you will not be tortured will you where you will not even get a headache allahu akbar in paradise you will not get a headache in paradise you will not bleed in paradise do you know the lowest level of paradise the lowest level of paradise is 10 times better than everything in this world do you know the last man to enter paradise the last man to enter jannah he gets to have 10 times of what is in this world allahu akbar the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he says, Allah frees people from hellfire every night and that is every night of Ramadan. What that means is your freedom from hellfire might come on a random day in Ramadan. All right, meaning you just fasted good, that you, you did what you had to do that day. You know what? You prayed your five prayers on time. You might, might have even caught some of them in jama'ah, in congregation. You prayed tarawih, you focused, you were into it. You didn't get into any fights that day. You had a moment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe you were reading Quran that day and you, you came across a story or you were listening to a lecture and you felt close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that day. That's the, that was your night. That was the night that Allah freed you from hellfire. Right? It can be any night. It could be the first night of Ramadan. We ask Allah that it's the first night of Ramadan. You want it to be the first night, right? So you pursue this every single night that Allah is going to free me from hellfire tonight, that I'm going to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way that I will be amongst those who are freed tonight. I'm not going to wait uh, for another night. Abu Sa'id narrates that the Prophet sallallahu says that whoever fasts one day seeking Allah's pleasure, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will distance his face away from the hellfire for a journey, a distance that covers a journey of 70 years. All right, so I'm going to say it in Arabic. مَنْ صَامَ يَوْمًا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ بَعَدَ اللَّهُ وَجْهَهُ عَنِ النَّارِ سَبْعِينَ خَرِيفًا This is an authentic hadith. It's a beautiful hadith. It's in Al-Bukhari. That for every day that you fast, seeking Allah's pleasure, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removes your face from the hellfire, a distance of a journey of 70 years. In another narration, the Prophet ﷺ, he said that he puts ditches between you, 70 ditches between you and hellfire, the distance between the two edges of each one of those ditches is the distance between the heavens and the earth. So if you fasted every single day of Ramadan, seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nothing else, how many years have been placed between you and Allah subhanahu wa between you and the hellfire? How much has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala distanced you from the hellfire? In another hadith, uh, Uthman ibn Abil As, he says that the Prophet sallallahu says, as sawmu jannatun min nar Fasting is a shield from hellfire. This hadith is sahih as well. That fasting is like a shield from the hellfire. SubhanAllah, isn't that beautiful? Like, so just to recap, Allah frees people from hellfire. And when Allah frees you from hellfire, that's it, right? Like when Allah makes you one of the utaqa, we ask Allah to make us amongst them, those who are freed, it means Allah has freed you from hellfire. All right? And if you do it every single day, you seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you're fasting properly, 70 years between you and hellfire or 70 ditches between you and hellfire. All right? And then Rasulullah says, fasting is your shield from hellfire. It's like a protection from the hellfire uh, for you. The devil's departure. Our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us, that when Ramadan approaches, the eight doors of Jannah are open. The seven doors of hellfire are closed. The mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bestowed. The forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is released. And the shayateen, the devils, are locked up. All of this is out of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us. And imagine that it was showering rain, which you're very used to. Imagine this rain are the drops of mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they choose the homes on which they will drop. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy, His forgiveness, His rewards, will drop on certain people. And there are certain people who will be chosen for this Ramadan to feel the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through it. Imagine this Ramadan as an intensive course. The Prophet ﷺ said 
the shayateen are tusaffad al-shayateen. They are imprisoned and chained up during Ramadan. Yet a lot of us, we get temptations and whispers during Ramadan. Isn't that right? We still get whispers in Ramadan. The meaning of that is, number one, the shaitan prepares allies before Ramadan comes. So bad friends whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy does not reach them. Remember the rain that falls on the homes? The rain that falls on the homes, well, this type of a person's heart is so dark and so full of rust and has neglected the Quran and Salat for so long during the year that not even the month of Ramadan or any Quran or any masjid can affect them anymore. Their soul is not nurtured. So the shaitan uses these people to do what? To influence the Muslims, the believers. He leaves them behind during Ramadan. The other thing the shaitan does is he whispers to you and puts in doubts in your minds on top of your desires before Ramadan comes. And I try to do this every Ramadan. I actually remind myself of this statement of Allah every morning in Ramadan. This is the month in which Quran came down. This is the month in which the course of humanity shifted. The map of the world changed because of this one month. Billions of lives have been transformed. Families and lineages and heritages have been completely transformed because of this one month. If you think of all of human, all human history as one lifetime, if all of human history is one lifetime, then the month of Ramadan is not even a second. It's not even a second. But it constitutes the most important turning point in human history. That one second, the course of humanity changes forever. And it changes in more significant a way than has ever happened in the entire, entire span of humanity. Subhanallah, that is the month we're experiencing. That is the month Allah Azza wa is highlighting. And I make it a point to say that because if Allah can transform the course of the future of humanity in that one month, how much change can He bring into my life in that one month? Many people, they skip their suhoor. Some people, they have an early suhoor. That is, they have the suhoor one or two hours before the Fajr time. In fact, suhoor is a blessing. Every Muslim should have it. And the Prophet said, we should delay the suhoor as much as possible. We should have it till just before the Fajr time. Ramadan comes along, some people act as if a food festival has come to town. We have this type of food and that type and this appetizer and that. And Ramadan is actually a month of fasting. That means that the month is not about eating. The month is actually about feeding. Feeding the needy people, putting in the effort. The Prophet ﷺ said whoever feeds a fasting person gets the reward of that fasting person with the same reward without taking away from that fasting person. So this Ramadan, don't focus so much on attending all these food festivals, focus on feeding the needy. The third mistake committed by Muslims in this category is that they delay opening their fast. They delay their iftar. And our Prophet Muhammad said that the people will be good as long as they hasten in breaking the iftar. That means immediately after sunset, they should break the iftar. Iftar parties are actually a very, very good thing as long as some conditions are met. It's very good because, alhamdulillah, in the month of Ramadan, you feed someone and subhanAllah, you get the reward of every single person that you have fed. And so I always say, you know, iftar parties are actually good as long as the other acts of worship or, for example, our taraweeh prayer or maghrib prayer or isha prayer, they're not suffering because of the iftar party. Or, subhanAllah, one of the problems with iftar parties is sometimes uh, we'll commit sins uh, during this iftar party. This subhanAllah goes against the whole spirit of the month of Ramadan where we're supposed to cut out all sins. Obviously, we cut out all sins in the whole year, but especially where we work extra hard in the month of Ramadan. So make sure that, yeah, have the iftar party. Alhamdulillah, make the intention that you're feeding your brothers and sisters. Make the intention that you're bringing people together. Make the intention that you are encouraging one another 
uh, to do goodness. And all of that are great reasons to have iftar parties. But just make sure that the iftar party is not causing you, like I said, delay your maghrib or not pray isha or delay your taraweeh or not pray taraweeh at all. One important thing that I've been witnessing lately is that people are unable to manage their anger. Now it's like they have a short temper or something or it's because they can't have their cigarette or their coffee so they just release their anger and become very furious at you and make you feel like it's the end of the world. Allahu Akbar. Now how can we solve this issue? We can solve this issue by knowing that when you do not control your anger in Ramadan, what happens? You are wounding your fast up. I'm not saying that it may, it, I'm not saying that it's not accepted. It may be accepted, but you're wounding it up. Just like when you bring a man and you start smacking him around until he has bruises all over his face and you see the blood everywhere and all that. Same thing with fasting. When you fast and you start getting angry at everybody, you are wounding your fasting up. Here in this case, we say, hold up, hold up, stop it, calm down. Relax. Say, "A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajeem Say, "I seek refuge with Allah from the from the devil, the devil, the shaytan." During the month of Ramadan, you will find the masjids completely packed out during tarawih prayers, which is amazing. But then, during the five daily prayers, you will notice the masjids are nowhere near as packed. Unfortunately, many people have mixed up their priorities. The fard obligatory five daily prayers have been put below the sunnah tarawih prayers. Although nobody can deny the importance of the tarawih prayers, which comes with an abundance of rewards and blessings, the five daily prayers will always be greater and above all the sunnah or optional prayers. So please do not neglect your obligations this month. This world, addiction to the things of this world, is a curse. So we do need to handle our devices for social media in a very positive and calculated way. We can't just, just do it whenever we feel like, however we feel like. So we have the choice of either making our social media experience something which is going to be on our scale of good deeds or something which is not going to be on our scale of good deeds. We have to decide beforehand. We're already caught up. We can't live without our phones. At least when we're going on the phones, we should be conscious of the impact which this phone has on ourselves as well as on others. There is so much information there, so much corruption there. Some people call it, instead of the internet, they call it the fitna net. So we best should say Bismillah before we even get on. Before we turn it on and start, we say Bismillah. Now, if we are not able to say Bismillah, this is telling us something. We're going on with the wrong intention. There's no harm in keeping contact with your friends, your circle, um, certain programs, etc. There's no harm, but we have to make sure that whatever we are interacting with is from the halal. During Ramadan, many Muslims try to finish the Quran as fast as possible. Some people finish reciting it two, three, or even five times. SubhanAllah, as though it's a speeding competition. It is recited without any understanding or contemplation. Although there is always benefit in reciting the verses of the Quran, there is a greater benefit in reciting with understanding because the purpose of the Quran is to guide mankind. And how can we be guided if we don't take time to understand the verses? So make this the month you truly connect with the Qur'an. The purpose of Ramadan is to reconnect the believer to the Book of Allah like they, they're starting over. And the reason that's important is because the believer is supposed to reconnect humanity with the Book of Allah. 
the way we do that in Ramadan, the way the first generation did that in Ramadan, the Prophet ﷺ institutionalized additional prayers. Umar bin al-Khattab saw that people might lose out on that, so he made it into congregational, what we call the Taraweeh prayer. Yeah? And it became an institution in this Ummah. Now that institution, if you imagine the Sahaba, every time they stood in prayer and they heard Baqarah, Ali Imran, Nisa being recited, they heard the message and they understood the message. They appreciated the miracle all in the Salah. All in the Salah. You know, you sometimes you hear a powerful lecture. For them, standing in the Salah is hearing a lecture from Allah. That's what it was. They were listening to a khutbah, a maw'idah from Allah when they're standing in prayer, yes? Mm -hmm. And that was the institution. It was supposed to reconnect us with Allah Azza wa Jal in the most beautiful of ways. Okay. A few centuries later, we also have the Taraweeh prayer. Is there a difference between the way we conduct our prayers today mm -hmm. and the pray and the spirit of those prayers of Umar bin Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu? Uh, there's a fundamental difference. The vast majority of you and me that are standing behind the Imam as he's reciting the word of Allah are not hanging over every word lost and mesmerized in reflection. Rather, we are wondering, was that the first or the second? Are we on 14 or on 15? When is the ruku' coming? If the Imam takes so much as a long breath, you're like, <sighs> and then he goes on to the next time, like, oh, okay, 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 okay. You know, some of my friends that lead Taraweeh, they're like, they're on purpose, when they get to Ayatul Kursi, they take a pause. Allahu, la ilaha illahu al hayyul qayyum. And everybody's like, oh yeah, oh God. I thought it was Allahu Akbar. <laughs> you know, what I'm trying to get at, uh, besides the joke, is there's a tragedy in the Ummah. This month was supposed to genuinely reconnect us with the guidance and the appreciation and the awe of the Quran. So it can separate right and wrong for us again. But today, our relationship with the Qur'an has been reduced to an artificial one where we stand in prayer and the vast majority of us don't know what's being recited. We run after the best reciter and stand behind them and wonder why the person next to us is crying. And some people are crying because they don't understand. And that's a good thing. That's a beautiful thing by itself. But then there are just a few that understand and they're moved. Sometimes the Imam himself is moved. And then we're completely okay with the culture that even the one leading us in prayer has no idea what they're reciting. And we're okay with that. We're okay with that. We've accepted that as a, as a tradition. Yeah? Is there something wrong with this? There's, you see some problem? We have violated the spirit of Ramadan so badly on every account. On every account. And then on top of that, if you didn't finish the recitation of the entire Quran, that's why we got to speed it up in the last few days. And there's complaints about this reciter is reciting too slowly. Who cares about finishing the Qur'an in Ramadan? I'd rather we pray less but pray with attention and pray with awe. Pray with understanding. Get some guidance for it. Reflect. That's what the spirit of this prayer was supposed to be. Many of the Muslims, they stay awake the full night and then they sleep in the day. And they do the normal activity the night time and sleep in the daytime. They're converting day into night and night into day and the whole purpose of fasting is defeated. Now, in this blessed month of Ramadan, there are three stops, or there are three stations that you don't ever want to miss. And SubhanAllah, this is the mercy of this blessed month that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us these three stops or stations for this blessed month. The first station, the first stop comes where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَنْ قَامَ رَمَضَانْ إِيمَانًا وَاحْتِسَابًا غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدْمَ مَنْ زَمِنْ Whosoever does Qiyam, i.e. Taraweeh, in the month of Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall forgive all of his previous sins. The second station is مَنْ صَامَ رَمَضَانْ إِيمَانًا وَاحْتِسَابًا غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ زَمْنِ Whosoever fasts in the month of Ramadan with Iman and hoping the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ زَمْنِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive all of his previous sins. And the third stop or station comes which is مَنْ قَامَ لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ إِيمَانًا وَاحْتِسَابًا غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ زَمْنِ Whosoever does Qiyam or Tahajjud and Taraweeh on the night of Laylatul Qadr, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall forgive all of his previous sins. Now subhanallah, this is an amazing opportunity for all those that have committed tons of sins in the accord of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of us have committed sins, small sins, major sins, all the different variety of sins. But let us use this blessed month of Ramadan that where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, gives us three opportunities for us to rectify ourselves with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah. This is an amazing opportunity for those who have been thinking of coming back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there is this reluctancy between them, you know, being ashamed of their sins. Here's an opportunity for you. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in an authentic hadith, Thalathatun la turaddu da'watum. Three kinds of people when they make dua to Allah, their dua is surely not rejected. Number one, as-sa'imu hatta yuftar. The one who makes dua when they're about to break their fast. Number two, awal imam al-adil. And the just ruler making dua. And number three, wa da'watu al-mazlum. And the dua of a person who has been oppressed. And he, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and don't forget, say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, and I love this hadith the Prophet is stressing he says basically the one who has been fasting and breaks their fast that time when they make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah will surely accept it and not reject it what a golden opportunity that we don't want to miss Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brothers and sisters appreciates it at the pinnacle and the climax of your hunger of your weakness of your tiredness and the food is being presented here and there and you actually remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you make dua to him during that time right around Adhan Maghrib Adhan you're about to pick your fast and you make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah appreciates that and Allah tells you you make dua that time I will accept it and I will not reject it Allahu Akbar some people may ask brother what time exactly shall I make dua to get this like golden opportunity the ulama, many of them have said there's room for it. So some have said you can make dua a few minutes before the adhan of Maghrib comes in. And some say you can make that dua after adhan and after your iftar, you break your fast, then you can make your dua and may Allah accept it whatever time suits you best. Brothers and sisters from the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to make a specific dua during that time when he was about to break his fast. He used to say, The thirst is gone, and the veins are moist, and the reward is guaranteed by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brothers and sisters, be optimistic like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and follow the sunnah and make that dua and add whatever you wish. So don't be so distracted before at that time with all the food. Rather, seize the moment and make dua during that precious time. What is the first thing Allah wanted us to know about Ramadan? Shahru Ramadan, alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an. The first thing He told us about the ayah, the month of Ramadan is the one in which the Qur'an was sent down. There's no mention of what yet? Fasting. There's no mention of fasting. The only thing, this is a month, the Qur'an came down in it. So now the Muslim knows, the thing that makes us different, that Qur'an, that incredible gift of Allah that was revealed in this month, this month is better than every other month, automatically. This book is better than all previous revelation. It's the ultimate revelation, the final revelation of Allah Azza wa Jal. This month must be the best month of all. The Muslim hasn't even heard about the fasting yet, but he knows this is the best month. Now maybe the next words are going to tell us about fasting. Shahru Ramadan, alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an, hudan lin nas. Qur'an is a guidance for people. The conversation is no longer about Ramadan, the conversation is about the Qur'an. The Qur'an is so important in this ayah that the subject of the, the month of Ramadan is stopped. And the conversation began about the Qur'an itself. You should get reintroduced to the Qur'an. And let me tell you what Allah says about the Qur'an in this ayah. Number one, He says, Hudan lin nas. It's a guidance for people. Do Muslims already know that? Yes. وَبَيِّنَاتٍ مِّنَ الْهُدَىٰ It has multiple proofs and multiple clear teachings that come from guidance. Do Muslims already know that? وَالْفُرْقَانِ And it makes a dis distinction between right and wrong. It, it, it dictates a criteria, a standard between right and wrong. Do Muslims already know that? Yes. Everything Allah said about the Qur'an in this ayah is something the Muslims already knew or didn't know. They already knew. 
What is Allah telling us? When this month comes, it's almost as though you are getting reintroduced to the Quran. It's like you're coming to the Quran for the first time all over again. Every time. You should feel like you just became a new Muslim Ummah. Every Muslim should feel like he just became a Muslim. You know when somebody just becomes a Muslim, they really want to read the Quran. I just want to read, what does it say? What does God say to me? There's a curiosity, right? Allah wants us to have that fresh take on the Quran every single month. Every single month of Ramadan. Not for just the fasting, not just to get the foods. Most of us end up gaining weight in Ramadan, not losing weight. I will recite the Quran like I've never recited it before. I will read the same ayat like I've never read them before. This is the beauty of these ayat. The Jews believed that their book was guidance for all of mankind? No. They believed that their Torah was guidance only for them. Allah says, Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an hudan linnas. Not this time. You new nation, you don't get to keep it for yourself. This will be a guidance for everyone. So you know what those words mean? Allah didn't just say hudan lakum. It's guidance for you people. He said hudan linnas. You know what that means? This month I will learn the Qur'an I will reintroduce myself to it, but I know for a fact, this book will not walk itself over to the people. Who will have to give it to the people? You and I will. Because it is guidance not just for you and me, it is guidance for the people. The month of Ramadan is a reminder that we have to share Quran with humanity. Just in the words, Hudan Linnas. When you share the Quran with humanity, they ask for proof. They ask, why do you believe this is the word of God? What's your proof? What's your evidence? Give me something. Don't they say that? Allah says in the next words, very logical, وَبَيِّنَاتٍ مِّنَ الْهُدَىٰ Bayinat means proofs, clear evidences that come from guidance. Not only does it guide people, it proves to them that this is the guidance too. You don't have to come up with some outside evidence, the evidence is inside the Qur'an. Anybody with decency, human decency is going to see that. They're going to come to this book with the right intention, and they will find guidance and the proofs that this is guidance. It will validate that for them. وَبَيِّنَاتٍ مِّنَ الْهُدَىٰ and once they accept those proofs, it will tell them which way is wrong and which way is right. Wal Furqan. It'll separate right and wrong for them. So it started with a guide, an invitation for people, a guidance for people. It'll prove itself to them. And once it proves itself to them, they will pick the right way from the wrong way because it'll draw a line for them. Don't do this and do this. Live this way and don't live this way. Subhanallah. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did say, رغم أنفه رغم أنفه رغم أنفه May his nose be rubbed in dust three times And the Sahaba said Who ya Rasulullah? He said من بلغ رمضان ولم يغفر له Whoever reaches Ramadan and they haven't been forgiven So there is no greater opportunity than the time of Ramadan for our forgiveness O you who has regretted their sins O you who knows of secret sins that no one else knows about And you, and you cry in the night and you feel so guilty about it And you've given up almost hope this is your time, insha'Allah ta'ala, to get rid of this burden off your shoulders and for it to replace in your heart a sweetness, sweetness, sweetness of happiness, of iman that you have never felt before. Brothers and sisters in Islam, the shaitan comes directly from the front, directly from the back through his allies and he, through his deception and from the front through his allies and leaving a seed in your desires before Ramadan and from the sides, the shaitan finds it difficult. The, sh the angels are there. And here is where the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His love for you is really shown. That above you is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whose mercy descends upon you. And when you lift your arms up to Allah in dua, Allah does not allow any evil, any obstacle, any distraction between you calling upon your dear Lord and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responding to His beloved servant. It's a direct, direct connection. And Allah says in the Quran, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِ فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ And if my servants ask you about me, O Messenger of God, tell them, Messenger of Allah, Tell them, I am close, I am very close. You know, like what a mother says to a child when the child wakes up in the night and the child's very scared, seen a nightmare. Mom, Dad, and they come close to them and they say, don't worry, I'm here, I'm close, I'm with you. You go to school and they say, don't worry, I'm with you. Just remember your mom, remember your dad. You know, I'm with you. When a dear friend tells you wherever you go, just hold this, remember, I'm with you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you like the nurturing mother saying to its child, I am with you. فَإِنِّي قَرِيب, I am close. I will respond to the person who calls upon me when they call, so let them respond to my call. 
let them respond to me because the way that I command you, Allah is saying, is the way to me, is the way to me. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us something or prohibits us something, He is actually drawing the line or the road for you in how to get to close to Him, how to feel His presence, subhanahu wa ta'ala. To the point where, to the point where you continue to do the compulsory actions until you do the voluntary actions after that, until Allah says, I become your eye which you see with, your hearing which you hear with, your leg which you walk with, your hand which you touch with. And if you were to ask me for anything, I will give you. And if you seek refuge in me from anything, I will give you protection. And one of the questions, one of the most off questions I get from young people is, you know what, my Iman is just not doing too well. Like I have a dip in my Iman and I just don't feel it anymore. Or a lot of times people who start practicing Islam, they'll have this Iman high and they're doing really, really well. And then a time will come where, where they'll be like, you know, it just doesn't feel the same anymore. Or a lot of times reverts and converts will say, when I first became Muslim, it was the most amazing experience of my life. And I want that back. I want that experience back. And one of the first questions I ask these people is, how is your connection with Allah? How is your Qiyam al-Layl? When was the last time you got up in the middle of the night or in the last third of the night to pray to your Lord? And if the answer, answer usually is, well, I don't, I don't really do that. I mean, I just try to do my five daily prayers. I'm just happy if I can get that in. And I tell them, I say, listen, if you're cutting off your connection with Allah, how are you going to get better? You can't expect your Iman to just get fixed all of a sudden on its own. It's not going to happen. You have to take steps for you to become a better Muslim. You have to take steps to reach that level of Iman. The discipline that is achieved through the month of Ramadan is unique and amazing. Let me mention to you one thing. There are certain things that are haram to eat. Do you agree? Like for example, you have pork, you have alcohol, you have so many other things, that which is not slaughtered correctly and whatever else. So many things are prohibited. You're not allowed. Now look. For one whole month, from dawn to dusk, we stay away from that which is halal. Water is halal. I cannot have it in Ramadan during that time, from dawn to dusk. Why? Discipline myself for the sake of Allah. Allah said, don't have it. So if I manage to stay away from that which was halal for one whole month, then surely after that, I can appreciate that which is halal by eating it and stay away from haram at least, at least. So I did not drink water. I did not have relations with my own spouse, which is otherwise halal. But in the daytime of Ramadan, it is a big prohibition. No, control yourself, discipline yourself, restrain yourself. That is what Ramadan is all about. You restrain yourself, you control yourself, subhanallah. So for one whole month, I stayed away from that which was halal. For the other 11 months, I can easily stay away from that which was haram. I'll appreciate the halal. You know, it's like a catapult. You know how a catapult works? You have this catapult and you have a stone. You put the stone at, in, in one part of it and you pull it back. How much do you pull it back? A little bit. That uh, stone will actually shoot out of there very, very far. So to me, Ramadan is like a catapult. You're actually pulling back and you throw. When you throw, it helps you for the other 11 months. By the time the stone lands, you are already in another month of Ramadan. You follow what I'm saying? This is spirituality. It's one way of looking at it. There are so many other ways. So, it is so vigorous, it requires energy such that you've used it so powerfully in this month that the rest of the 11 months, you are just sailing, you are flying, you are cruising, cruising. And when by the time it comes to land, you are already, you have the stone again and you pull it back and you are again moving for the other 11 months. One of the scholars of the past said, the sign of an accepted Ramadan is that you're a better Muslim at the end of the month than you were before the beginning of the month. What does this mean? It means that Ramadan should raise your level up for the rest of the year. Not just till the day of Eid. The purpose of Ramadan is to give us that Iman boost. Ramadan is an upgrade in salary. Ramadan is becoming a manager in your company. Once Ramadan is over, does anybody like to take a downgrade? Does anybody want to go back to what, what they were getting paid as a lower person, lower, lower salary person? Does anybody like to go move down in the company? Nobody likes that. In Ramadan, even the 
non-practicing Muslim takes an upgrade, becomes a manager, gets a bigger paycheck. Even the Muslim who doesn't pray five times a day, they have some iman, they begin to pray, come to the masjid, start fasting. Isn't this true? We see this, right? Unfortunately, many of them, when the month finishes, khalas, they go back to exactly where they were. And you would not want to do this for your job, for your corporation, under your boss. Why are you satisfied when it comes to Jannah and Nar to go back to an older position? Allah blessed you to boost you up, to take you higher. Now remain as high as you can. Okay, you maybe cannot remain that high. You cannot pray Taraweeh every night, Qiyam every night. That's understandable that you're not going to remain that high. But don't go back crashing down to where you began. If you went up a hundred notches when Ramadan finishes, okay, you'll move down 10, 20, 30. But don't go back down a hundred to where you began. The purpose of Ramadan, you climb up the ladder as high as you can. When Ramadan finishes, you move a little bit down, it's understood. But move only a little bit down. And then remain as high as you can till the next Ramadan. Where are you going to move up again and then up again? And therefore, every Ramadan brings you closer and closer to Allah. Every Ramadan is that Iman boost that causes you to become a better Muslim. There's the sin that you have. This Ramadan is when you're going to give it up. There's a, a good deed that you're not doing. This Ramadan is the Ramadan. You're going to start doing it. And if you have this attitude, every single Ramadan, what's going to happen? Inshallah. Ta'ala, every year you will come closer to Allah as you come closer to death and that is exactly the purpose of this month. The last day of Ramadan, there's no taraweeh tonight. Why am I so sad? Why am I so sad a day before Eid when really I should be happy? I don't know what's wrong with me. From Ramadan to Ramadan, time after time, it's the same story. The same story. I thought I'd be able to pray a lot, read a lot of Quran and change my life around. Instead, I feel so ashamed of myself. How could I let Ramadan go just like that? How? I didn't make the most of it, no way. I can't believe I let the opportunity of Ramadan escape. Escape without making a real difference in my life. What if I don't get another Ramadan? What if I don't get this opportunity to change my life again? Ya Allah, forgive me in the last moments of this blessed month. For indeed I haven't worshipped you as you deserve to be worshipped.